There are two major hypotheses for which chemicals were already present on Earth, or that formed when the planet formed about 4.8 billion years ago. The term prebiosis refers to chemical and physical conditions that enable the origins of life under one or another of these sets of conditions. One hypothesis shown here assumes a reducing atmosphere on the prebiotic Earth that led to an origin of heterotrophs and heterotrophic metabolisms first, from which all other cells and metabolisms then must have descended. The other hypothesis begins with a non-reducing Earth atmosphere and suggests that autotrophs came first, with autotrophic metabolism first powered by a natural proton gradient. Based on an analysis of the atmosphere of oxygenless and presumably lifeless planets in our solar system, Jupiter, Venus, Saturn, Alexander Operin and J.B.S. Haldane suggested that the early Earth's atmosphere would be, like those planets, rich in inorganic chemicals that, with the help of an input of energy, would have seeded the oceans with organic molecules. The principal chemical constituents on a prebiotic Earth, as proposed by Operin and Haldane, were mainly carbon dioxide, water, that is water vapor, hydrogen sulfide, as well as some methane, ammonia, and even perhaps some hydrogen gas. There would have been, of course, no free oxygen, but many oxides. The physical conditions predicted by Operin and Haldane were, to say the least, hellish. It was hot. Without oxygen, there could be no ozone layer to absorb ionizing radiation like X-rays and gamma rays, which could reach the Earth's surface in abundance. There would have been ionizing electrical storms, lots of volcanic activity, and, under the oceans as they were forming, thermal vent activity. These were abundant sources of free energy. In their famous experiment, shown here, Stanley Miller and Harold Urey fed gases like ammonia, hydrogen, methane into water vapor created by heating water in the ocean in the flask on the left. After the gases mix with the water vapor, they get an electrical shock, here it is, an electrical shock or some other ionizing radiation. When the vapor then condenses, the water in the ocean flask can now be shown to contain organic molecules. The experiment demonstrated that the chemical and physical conditions of a prebiotic Earth, as predicted by Operin and Haldane, could in fact have produced a primordial soup of energy-rich molecules. The earliest data from Miller and Urey indicated the presence of several organic molecules, including a few familiar metabolic organic acids, like lactate and acetate, and amino acids as well as several highly reactive compounds like aldehydes and nitriles. The latter would be expected to participate in spontaneous chemical reactions that formed organic compounds. Later experiments, including some based on results that Miller left behind when he died in 2010, reveal that purines, carbohydrates, fatty acids, and as many as 23 different amino acids could also be found in his artificial primordial soup. There's the urea, lactate, and acetate uh, in that list uh, that I neglected to show you. Let's remind ourselves of how monomers polymerize by dehydration synthesis, that is condensation reactions, to make polysaccharides, polypeptides, and nucleic acids. These water removal reactions characterize polymer formation. Here is a way that this could have happened on a prebiotic Earth. High heat could have fueled catalytic polymer formation in prebiotic tidal pools as animated here. Imagine tides go out, leaving a hot tidal pool in which organic molecules concentrate as the water evaporates. High heat, or heat of baking as it's sometimes called, on mineral-rich clays could have catalyzed polymerization reactions before there were enzymes or even protein. Finally, high tides come in and resupply the monomers. This scenario could have worked if the newly made polymers were in some way anchored to the sediments in which they formed. Otherwise, receding tides would constantly disperse and dilute the polymers in a wider ocean. Could the same cyclic tides have produced replicating polymers? Let's take a look. As monomers once again concentrate in an evaporating tidal pool, so would short polymers. For example, oligonucleotide RNAs. At some point, monomer nucleotides might find their complements on these short polymers. The combined heat of baking and clay-based catalysis we saw before would replicate a complementary nucleic acid strand. Imperfect replication could generate related families of polymers shown here. When the tides return, the monomers are replenished. 
renewed evaporation, heat and catalysis in the pool, repeats the cycle, this time replicating and expanding the related families of nucleic acid strands. Again, this could only be efficient if the newly made polymers were in some way anchored to or trapped in their catalytic sediments. All in all, this scenario hung together nicely for many decades. But what if the Earth's environment was in fact a non-reducing one? 